Today, I'm talking with Hunter Hastings of the Mises Institute. Hunter is the host of the podcast Economics for Business, and he is a venture capitalist and an economic educator. Specifically, he has a lot of knowledge about Austrian economics and how it relates to entrepreneurship. Hunter, thanks for taking the time out of your day to come on the call with me. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Yeah, you know, I've I've enjoyed listening to your podcast over the past so probably a couple of years. Um and I'm I'm wondering if you can kind of give me an idea about yourself and how you got interested in entrepreneurship. Well, it's quite a long journey, Aaron. Uh I got educated in economics at university. I went into the the business world. I worked at Procter and Gamble and I was uh marketing detergents, an old fashioned concept today, but it was quite big when I started. And then I found that I was able to resell that experience, that knowledge of, of marketing as consulting, helping other people to, or other companies to improve their marketing and grow their brands. And that became a, a career I've, I've done uh, marketing consulting inside big consulting companies and also established a couple of my own. I had a couple of diversions where uh, my clients would hire me to come and be their chief marketing officer for a while. So I got to see the other side again. So it's always good to, uh, to see both sides, the corporate side and the uh, entrepreneurial side. I was very briefly a, a startup CEO in Silicon Valley in uh, 1999 and 2000, just before the crash. And then I, I continued with consulting. And then uh, toward the end of that period, I joined a group of partners in a seed stage venture capital fund. So that means you see lots and lots of entrepreneurial businesses. You try to form some judgments about which ones to bet on. And uh, you get to coach them through the through the growth phases and you get to see what, what succeeds and what doesn't. So uh, I've had a long career in entrepreneurship. Okay. And you mentioned that you started out selling detergents. And I think I heard on one podcast I listened with you, you were selling Tide. Is that what you were working on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I always, I'm wondering if you could kind of define entrepreneurship and what it is, because I, the way I think about it, it's like using your, creativity and imagination to to do things in a better way and i don't know if that's right but that's how i think about it and i think that you could even be an entrepreneur if you're working for a company say you know it's uh, marketing detergents you can think you can be creative uh, if your company allows it and think of better ways to do things but can you define for us what entrepreneurship is and how you define it yes yeah, so that your your explanation is a pretty good one Aaron, let me break it down just a little bit more. The purpose of a business, any business, is to create value. And in Austrian economics, we define value as a feeling. It's, it's a feeling and it's a process. It happens over time. So they're constantly learning what to want. And they're constantly learning what's available. They're setting standards. But they're always aiming for betterment. They'd always like something to be, to be better. And so the job of entrepreneurs is to discern that, understand what betterment customers are seeking, how, how would they like to improve their lives. We sometimes call that dissatisfaction. So you're measuring a negative. What, what are they dissatisfied about? And then to create some solution, a product or a service that will relieve that, that dissatisfaction. And by definition, that's, def that's better than anything that's out there because um, the customer was dissatisfied with the status quo and they're, they're more happy with the new product or service. So entrepreneurship as a function in the economy is this, this brilliant translation of customer dissatisfaction into new, new products and services. And it never stops. It's constantly rotating. The customer's always learning. The entrepreneur's always improving. Um, and to your point, yes, it can happen at any size of business. Entrepreneurship is what produces economic growth and profits and innovation. 
Uh, the issue with big business is that large parts of them are not entrepreneurial. So I worked in the marketing department. That was, entrepreneurship was my job. But the HR department and some parts of the finance department and anything to do with compliance is not entrepreneurial. So um, the smaller the company, typically the more entrepreneurial. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned certain things are not entrepreneurial. And I, I would just, you know, I, I started thinking you mentioned compliance. You could think of creative ways to get around certain regulations that might give you a competitive advantage. And could that potentially be an entrepreneurial way of doing things? Yeah, we would tend to say not, although it might be in some circumstances, Aaron, but you're you're getting around those uh, regulations not to create value for customers, but to make things easier for the corporation. The original okay. source, the original source of the regulation was the government. Government doesn't produce anything. It only it only takes away from production or restricts production. And so if you find a nifty way to get around regulation, you're not really creating value for customers. You're just maybe making things a little bit more efficient for yourself. So I wouldn't count that as uh, as value creation, although it might well be creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the, the only thing that, uh, the thing that came to mind was say Uber, you know, uh, for years, uh, libertarian types tried to uh, lobby the government to get rid of the taxi medallion system, but then here Uber comes along and just says, ah, the heck with the regulations. We're going to just have this app on your phone and and you can you can get a ride just by tapping a few buttons on the app. But um, maybe I'm going a little too too deep on that. But No, 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 not at all. In fact, I'd like to build on that because it's a, it's a brilliant example. So you think of why Uber started, and it started exactly because of this dissatisfaction. If you've ever tried to get a cab on, in Manhattan on a rainy Friday night and you're standing on the curb, the cabs are going by, there's no lights on, and maybe one comes and you jump out into the rain and you wave your hand and it comes to you and then somebody pushes you out of the way and gets in the cab before you or it stops you know, half a block from you. It's intense dissatisfaction in, in dealing with cabs. So now if you could have something that you booked on your iPhone you confirm that reservation. You got a nifty little map that tells you where the cab is and when it's going to get there. You have created tremendous value for the, the cab rider. The regulation part was, was separate. Yes, they were super creative in, in getting around that and they had a lot of battles and so on. That wasn't part of the value creation. The value creation was all in making a better experience of of getting into a cab or of, of booking a cab and waiting for a cab. So uh, your choice of Uber as an illustration is perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you talk a lot about customer dissatisfaction, or you mentioned that several times. And I'm wondering how that ties in, if at all, with a quote that I've read from Steve Jobs, where he says, the customers don't know what they want until I give it to them. Do you think that's true? Yeah, there's this brilliant interchange between the customer and the entrepreneur, Aaron, and, and Jobs got it right. So what the customer can do is, is be dissatisfied. Boy, things could be better. They, I just wish it was easier to, I don't know, make a phone call or, or uh, you know, find where I'm going or whatever the kinds of things that iPhones do. But they couldn't invent the iPhone. So... As I said at the beginning, they're learning what to want. They don't know what to want. Austrians call that value uncertainty. I wish things were better, but I don't know how to do it. And then you have a brilliant entrepreneur who produces something that can solve all those problems. And maybe they didn't do it specifically to cater to that, that consumer, but they did invent it. It only has any value if they align with the customer. The customer learns that the iPhone can solve their problem. And Jobs and Apple learn how to fine tune that iPhone so it's just right. And it's this process of alignment between the customer and, and the entrepreneur. So we always argue <laughs> in circles, you know, who creates value? Is it the customer by having the need or is it the entrepreneur by providing the solution? And the answer is it's co-creation of value. 
It's both parts of that equation coming together. And it's the alignment, getting it just right, uh, that is the, the, the solution to value creation. And in constant change, Aaron, the, so the customers always change. Since I've got an iPhone, well, how could this be better? Maybe, maybe Android is better, or maybe something else is better. Constant, constant change. And so it's that, that's the brilliance of the entrepreneur, but you can only do it with the customers. Co-creation of value. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, you know, I think I like to read uh, biographies about great thinkers and entrepreneurs. And one thing that comes across a lot is is the their their courage, their imagination, and their determination. But I I had uh, per uh, Bielan, uh, Professor Per Bielan on the show a while back, and mm -hmm. he, he argued that actually it's not so much about creativity, it's more about implementation. And yeah, there's a ton of ideas out there, but really it's all about execution and implementing ideas. Where, where do you see the balance between those those two categories? Well, you use the right word. Per's a good friend, and he's, he's brilliant at entrepreneurial theory, and I'm not going to disagree with him at all, but there is imagination. And that's one of the great powers of the entrepreneur. It's creativity. It's, it's thinking up some new things. But as Pear rightly said, that in itself has no value. You've got to make this co-creation of value with the customer. So you've got to share the idea with the customer. You've got to get their reaction. You've then got to design and implement that, that idea. So another way of thinking about entrepreneurship, it's, it's a design process to get from the idea which is immaterial, it's in your head, it's imagination, to implementation. And there's a series, there's a series of steps to do that. You know, the, the first step is a sketch on the back of a napkin, and then the next step is maybe a prototype, and then you've got to do the business plan, and then you've got to find some manufacturer to manufacture it for you, or you've got to find AWS to host it for you. You keep making this series of steps until you get it to the point where uh, it can be implemented, and every step along the way, you've checked with the customer saying, does this look right? Would this meet your need? Is this something that you would buy? And so I would call that co-creation of value, yeah, through implementation. But it's, it's you start with imagination, you go through the design process, you get to the point where you take it to market and you align with the customer. So I'm not sure whether that answers your question. I don't think you can pull out these things that... It's the idea or it's the implementation. It's it's a process, an entire end-to-end -end process. Yeah. And you've recently started a new program uh, with along with the Mises Institute, uh, Economics for Business website. Uh, can you tell me more about that? Uh, I've looked into it a bit, but can you tell us more about what's going on there? Yes, absolutely. So we, we think that Austrian economics has a lot to say to help entrepreneurs and help businesses to be successful, to create value and do it profitably and, and grow. And so we developed this economics for business theme to take all of the best knowledge and research out of economics and turn it into useful business processes. And so we just talked about value creation. So we have a lot of value creation tools on the economics for business website. Like we call it the the value learning journey. So how customers decide whether there's any value in what you're offering and then they compare it with other things and then they, they look at the price and then they test it for social value. What will people think when I buy this? They buy it, they experience it, and then they evaluate it. You can check at every step and see how you're doing in, in value creation. Um, we talk about entrepreneurship. So we have a number of entrepreneurial processes. The other thing that we talk about is, is action, Aaron. In, in uh, Austrian economics, there's something called the action axiom. Entrepreneurs act. So instead of strategy and planning that you'd learn at business school, what you learn at economics for business is action. You, you're constantly experimenting. And there's a term for it. We call it explore and expand. So don't build a strategy. Explore and expand. Do lots and lots of experiments very quickly. Find out what works and what doesn't and, and get better and better that way. So business is a portfolio of experiments, not, not a strategy. Um, we've talked about the, the co-generation of value, and so we, we have a number of tools for that. 
And the, the whole thing is what we call the flow. So the market is constantly changing. Customers are constantly changing. Competitors are constantly changing. So how do you, how do you uh, adapt to that? We call it the adaptive entrepreneurial method. And we've got some materials on that as well. So what we want to offer to entrepreneurs is to come to the economics of business site to get knowledge. So there's lots of knowledge there that you can use. Actual tools. Uh, like process tools and checklists and things like that, what you should be doing. And we're building a community too, so that you can come and uh, share your questions or your ideas with other entrepreneurs and benefit from their experience. And that's the other thing, Aaron, that that uh, is a success factor in entrepreneurship is experience. If you're running all these experiments, you're always learning. Some work, some don't and you get experience. The more experience you have, the better you're going to be. But one way to get around that is to borrow experience from other people. So that's one of the things that we have at Economics of Business, a lot of what we call entrepreneurial journeys. You, you talked about reading biographies of uh, entrepreneurs, and we have some of those, but they're not the kinds of ones that get you know giant 300-page books written about them. They're they're in the construction industry, they're in the transportation industry, in the toy industry, and they're in consulting, they're in plumbing, whatever it might be. We have a number of those entrepreneurial journeys, and they're, they're really great to learn from. So knowledge, tools, and experience, that's what we're trying to offer to people at Economics for Business. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, what do you think got you interested in the education part of economics rather than... Uh, other aspects of it. I, I mean, maybe you are involved in other aspects of entrepreneurship as well that you could share with us, but it seems like you're specifically very interested in the education part. What draws you so much to that? Yeah, I think, Aaron, that uh, we have a vision, I have a vision anyway, of what I call the entrepreneurial society. So there's a lot of us that are very distressed about the political divisions that go on in this country and the, the loss of, of uh, politeness and decorum and so on. People seem to hate each other. And entrepreneurship is, is mutual value. What I just talked about was entrepreneurs having empathy for other people. I want to solve your problem. I want to make your life better. And I want to be rewarded for that if you buy what I'm, I'm offering. It's an ethic of service and an ethic of, of helping others. And so if we had an entrepreneurial society, then people would be focused on that, helping each other, and not focused on, on politics. I call it 100% economics, 0% politics. That's, that's the vision. And the only way you can change the culture is to educate people in that way. So we should be educating people at every level. We kind of focus on, on uh, what we call the middle class of business, the, the, the core of business in this country. Uh, people like Dr. Byland are teaching at universities and business schools, but we've got to get it into the, the high schools and, and throughout the country as well. So I'm really excited by that, that prospect. And you see so many young people now who are preferring entrepreneurship to, uh, to a corporate job or some other kind of job. I love what's happening in the, the Bitcoin and blockchain space. Uh, we look at healthcare, for example, where there's a big introduction of, uh, they call it direct primary care, where doctors get out of the big hospital um, systems and they start their own business with 300 patients who pay 50 bucks a month. And that's, that's enough to get you primary care and, and access to specialists and things like that. So entrepreneurship is happening all over the place. It's making the world better. And um, I think education will contribute to helping people to get into that mode as opposed to the political mode. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, li I like that. Have you have you read anything about uh, what Charles Koch is doing? It sounds like he does some education uh, along with some of these lines, and even in his businesses that he runs, he, it seems that he takes a very uh, entrepreneurship type approach to all his employees and the programs that he puts on. Have you uh, do you know anything about that? I've I've read his book. Uh... The Science of Success, I think it's called, yep. something like that. There's a, there's a ton of Austrian economics in there. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he has a wonderful approach to, to business, I think. And he, um, 
you know, he runs his company as a portfolio of businesses. He's not telling them what to do through central planning. He's giving them kind of uh, directions and a framework. And, and uh, he really believes in customer sovereignty, which is an Austrian concept of, you know, put the customer at the center and figure out what they want and, and get it to them and, and you'll do well. Um, I think yeah. he has a lot of educational programs and, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be a fan. I know in libertarian circles, he's got some, uh, some other kinds of reputation, but from an economic standpoint and a business standpoint, I think he's uh, a great source of knowledge. Okay. Yeah, I, I wondered that when I was reading his book is why why do you think it is that businesses as they grow bigger they become more and more like bureaucracies? Well, because they are bureaucracies, that's that's the problem. They as they get big, three things happen. One is they start to get defensive. So um, you talk about market share. Market share is a defensive concept. I've got to hold on to that. And, you know, they've got to report to um, the financial sector every quarter if they're publicly traded. So that's a defensive idea. You've, you know, you can't, you can't do worse. You've got to protect what you've got. So they start to get defensive. Um, then the second thing is they start to get too big to, to manage. So then you get the HR bureaucracy and you get the, um, the, uh, compliance bureaucracy and, and so on. And then the, the third thing is they, they misunderstand competition. And you know, in Austrian economics, we tell our entrepreneurs, don't, don't even think about competition. It's not a concept to worry about. What you're trying to be is unique. You know, one of the books I really like is uh, Peter Thiel's Zero to One. And he said, every business should be a monopoly. You should be mm. so differentiated. Your, your brand should be so loved that nobody can compete with it. And so don't even think about competition. Think about serving customers uniquely. So as, as companies get big, they, they lose that. But there are some interesting things going on uh, in the corporate world in terms of decentralization. There's a, a company that a lot of people study called Haier, H-A-I-E-R. It's a Chinese company. Um, but they've devolved into uh, tiny entrepreneurial units, typically, you know, 25 or 50 employees. Every business there is an entrepreneurial business. Now, some of them are in support functions and like IT and that kind of thing. And, and some of them are, are direct to customer, but they're all uh, aiming for entrepreneurial profit and aiming to be as efficient as possible and, you know, not have the, the bureaucracy that we've talked about. So, Interestingly, in the, in the world, um, companies are trying to figure out how to have more entrepreneurship and less bureaucracy and, and less overhead, and uh, that's, a, that's a, good, a good development. Yeah, yeah. You had mentioned Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. What, what kind of develop? You said that that's something that excites you. I'm also interested in that area. What kind of developments have you seen that are interesting to you? Well, just in general, Aaron, I'm not a um, an expert. I own I own some uh, Bitcoin. I'm happy to say, um, but it's a it's an entrepreneurial alternative to fiat currency and the banking system. And now people are starting to build businesses on the blockchain. And I learned an expression from uh, a young man in Germany that I talked to on my podcast. His name is Max Hillebrand, and he taught me about this value for value exchange. There's a world of free software development. So young people are writing code, developing software, maybe for themselves. And then they say, hey, somebody else may have a use for this. So they'll put it out for, um, for offer, for sale on, on the blockchain. But it's free. It's, hey, you can take this and use it. Um, if you think it has any value, send me some some Bitcoin, or more likely some Satoshis, right? They call it stacking sats. And right. so you learn what the customer values, because if they pay you, they obviously valued it. And there's this constant exchange of getting better and better all the time. So um, that kind of value for value exchange business that, that happens on the blockchain is just really, really exciting. And, you know, the whole development of, of uh, independent uh, exchange that you know is not regulated or less regulated it's not surveilled it's it's uh, pseudonymous and and so on i mean i think that's the future i just think that the 
entrepreneurs who are working in that field represent the, the future of independent entrepreneurship. So I'm cheering along. I don't know much about it, but I'm cheering. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the exciting apps that I've seen is an uh, app called Twetch, T-W-E-T-C-H. And I, it's a social network that's built on the Bitcoin blockchain. And when you log in, you can, when you like something, it costs five cents. When you post something, it costs two cents. Um, I think re retweeting or sharing is, is like another three cents, but it's really interesting. And you, you can, you can pay people, uh, just by commenting on their posts, you can say, pay so-and-so a few dollars. It's, it's, it's an interesting, um, business model, I think, because it's, you're making profit right from the get-go. Your, your first user is paying a few cents just to post. And, and you also get rid of a lot, of, a lot of the trolls and things like that that are, you see on Twitter. Yeah. So, yeah, check that out. I'll send you, I'll put a link in the show notes to this. So if anyone wants to join and connect with me on Twitch, uh, you can use that link. Yeah, I know there's quite a lot of podcasts that do something like that with, uh, you know, BTC pay server and, and those kinds of things. So, yeah, I think that's great. That's, you know, that's the, the, the customer's choice. If they choose to pay, then they're, they're deciding where they go on a social network as opposed to being directed by the Facebook algorithm, which is trying to figure out how to direct you to places where Facebook wants you to be. I think that's a good example of, uh, of customer choice in a free market. So I hope it works out. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I should mention, you know, the, I, I mentioned you're paying for these likes and posts, but if you're posting good content and you're getting a lot of likes, you, you're also making money. So, I, you know, it's pretty interesting. You know? But yeah, uh, it's a market. Yeah. So what, what would you say is the central theme that differentiates uh, Austrian economics from any other school of economics? Well, there's a there's a lot of components, really, but um, the two that are most important, I think, from a uh, an economic standpoint, are uh, what the academics called methodolog methodological individualism, and what that means is it's economics about people. So the uh, the economics that you learn in school and you read about in the Wall Street Journal. It's all about big aggregated numbers, GDP and the money supply and the, uh, the employment levels and so on like that. And they think that you can get big aggregates to work on other big aggregates. So if you increase the money supply, you'll raise employment, so on like that. Austrian economics is, is not those big aggregates. We believe that it's about people, it's about individuals, about how individuals make, make choices and how they interact with each other and, and how they create value. So um, methodological in, individual is one piece. And then it's a, it's a, what we'd call a free market approach. If, if those individuals are left to their own devices to create mutually acceptable exchanges, then you'll grow the economy. Then everybody's, uh, everybody will achieve betterment. And it's this, uh, positive way of, of developing value. And the Austrian uh, view of value, as I mentioned at the beginning, is subjective. It's about how people make the choices. People decide what to do. People have preferences. And so this, this whole idea of people working together in teams and in communities and so on like that to create value, that's what Austrian economics is all about. Um, the other kind of economics is, is, I call it government economics. It was developed to, uh, to give governments the opportunity to gain and regulate and, and uh, control the currency and those kinds of things. So uh, they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. What, have, you, have you come across ways of helping people who are interested or going through the program at Economics for Business? Um, to think more creatively or to become better entrepreneurs? Um, are there tips or tool, not really tools, but are there ways of thinking in, in just your daily life that you've come across that are helpful? Well, our, our motto is think better, think Austrian. And that's, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a general theme. We are trying to, to help people think better. It's a, a perspicacious question. From an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. standpoint, 
it's it's working backwards. So you you're taught about business as it's a it's a production. It moves forwards, right? You, as you said, you have the idea, then you develop it, and then you sell it, and then you you take it to market. But if you think like like we do, you work backwards. So you start with the customer. You start by identifying that that dissatisfaction. That dis dissatisfaction is an experience. So what would an experience look like that was better than that? And then you work backwards from that experience. How can I assemble that? How can I put that together? And we talk about value networks that you don't have to do it all yourself. You can, you can assemble a value network, but you work it backwards. And then in the design process, you got to turn that around and assemble what you just created from from working backwards, but you're always working backwards from the customer. So any feedback you get from the customer, bring it backwards and and uh, and process it. So I think thinking backwards and the other piece is thinking in systems because um, the customer is a system, the household is a system. When I was selling Tide to mom, right? Mom was a system. She she had a house to run. She had two kids to get to school. She had to do her washing and ironing back in the day and and that kind of thing. So how do I fit into that system? And you know, part of it is convenience, part of it is price, part of it is efficacy, part of it is having the, the, um, the attributes that she was looking for, but you, you humbly fit into the system. So you know, working backwards from the system and figuring out how you can fit into it, that's, that's another way. But thinking backwards is a good heuristic to use. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things you said is, is being dissatisfied can can help you come up with entrepreneurial ideas because if you're looking to satisfy or get rid of that feeling of dissatis dissatisfaction, you know, you may, I mean, some people just complain and, and don't do anything, but, you know, I guess that's one of the lessons I try to teach my kids is, hey, don't just complain. Well, well you don't like dinner? Uh, you can make dinner. Why don't you make something better? Uh, you know, I think I think that's something that we can practice in our daily life is at least for me, I try to, if I'm about to complain, I, I always try to say to myself, okay, I'm complaining, but what, what <laughs> could I do differently? <laughs> yeah, you're right. So uh, don't complain, create. I, I concur with that 100%. But if you, if you think about it, the genius of the customer is to be dissatisfied. You look at everything we've got today, and we're still dissatisfied, which is wonderful because that creates opportunity for the the entrepreneur. And uh, the quote we like to use, like Steve Jobs saying, you know, I've got, to, I've got to show them what to want, is Henry Ford, who said, if I'd asked them what they want, they, they would have said faster horses. And right. they were dissatisfied with the, with the horse and buggy world, but they didn't, they couldn't invent cars. But this, this idea of dissatisfaction, it's such a gift to the entrepreneur. It's, it's this genius gift of the customer to say, Make my life better. Hey, I'm inviting you in. Help me out here. And it's it's the energy that drives innovation and 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 creativity. So um, I I just love the idea of dissatisfaction. <laughs> it's 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 human brilliance at its best. Yeah, yeah. Is there a, as a person is thinking through ideas? You know, sometimes you can get you can get caught up in the the point where you're just uh, dismissing ideas right off the bat how do you find a balance between say coming up with an idea that you think might be good and um, not being too analytical about it, but, but as you say, just is the, is the answer to just go out and experiment? Absolutely. Don't analyze experiment. So if, if that idea can be an experiment, if it can be an AB test, if it can be a piece of market research, if it can be a, a conversation with your next door neighbor saying, what do you think of this? you get feedback and, and the more feedback that you get, the, the more accurate and more developed your, your concept, your idea gets. So never analyze, always experiment. If it's an idea that you can experiment with, run the experiment. What you owe to yourself is to run as many experiments as you can or a big portfolio of experiments and eventually something will emerge which you can focus on, you can narrow the uncertainty, you can make the bet, you can, you can develop the resources. So it's action, action, action. Don't think, don't analyze, act. That's, that's the whole principle. Yeah, yeah. 
you, you did mention, uh, you know, talk to your neighbor about it. One, one thing I found difficult about that approach is sometimes people will be trying to be too nice and they'll say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And other other times people will be just very dismissive. Like I think Steve Wozniak went to his employer to talk about the personal computer and they were like, oh, no one would ever want that. But are, do you have you talk about experimentation. Are there ways to just experiment that you that you know of where you can test the market and instead of asking people what do you think you can say uh would you mind to put uh some money on that you know are there are there small ways that you can kind of test the market without going full bore and and uh creating a full business that that you've come across yeah it depends the stage that you're at aaron but um don't tell them about a product like a personal computer tell them about an experience you know what if you had a little machine that you could you could type better on because typewriters are so clunky or you can get on the internet and retrieve knowledge and it sits there right in your desk and you can use it anytime. Don't ask them for the exchange value. Would you pay for it? Ask them about the experience value. Could you imagine? So we talked about imagination. Could you imagine yourself in that in that situation, would you enjoy that experience, do you think? So design an experience for them and then ask them if that's an experience that they would like. And that's that's the way to get the, the feedback as opposed to saying, I've invented the personal computer. Will you give me a thousand bucks for it? That, that That's not going to work because <laughs> they don't know what a they don't know what a personal computer is. But, um, you know, Steve Jobs put that iPhone in people's hands because he understood the frustration that they had. And one of the big things with that was the keyboard. So the BlackBerry was in existence. Everybody loved their Blackberries. And the one little thing they said was, the keyboard's clunky. You know, I, my thumbs keep banging into each other, and that's, that's a problem. So Jobs was trying to figure this out, and he, he had his own um, peccadillo about buttons. You know, he didn't like buttons. So... That's where the touchscreen uh, dial pad came from. So the consumer couldn't invent the dial pad, but they could say, eh, I don't like the buttons. And Jobs could say, well, what if there was an experience that didn't involve buttons and it was easier to do? I don't know what his research was. He, he famously uh, eschewed research, so maybe he didn't do any. But it's the experience, the experience of your thumbs not banging into each other when you're trying to type on a, on a BlackBerry keyboard. So if you can improve the experience, design the improved experience, you can ask people about that, and you can demo it to them and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, Hunter, I, I really appreciate your time today. I, I feel like uh, I've gotten a lot out of the conversation. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we end the call? No, I just uh, appreciate the invitation. It's been great spending time with you. Our, our URL is econ4business. It's E-C-O-N-4, the number four, business.com. So please go there and, and search around. Everything's free, except we've got one course on there that I think uh, one of our professors is charging money for. But everything else is free. And, and Tell us what you like and what you don't like, your dissatisfaction in, in the feedback. I write occasionally at hunterhastings.com, and I post a, a, a summary of all podcasts there. So if you want to go to hunterhastings.com, please do. And same thing, please communicate. And, of course, uh, the Mises Institute at Mises, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, Mises dot org. Our whole idea of Mises dot org is a free library all of the books on Austrian economics, all of the columns that our professors read, a whole bunch of videos and courses and research papers and untold amounts of, of uh, content in Austrian economics, and it's all free. And uh, you can buy some hardback books if you want to take them home with you, but everything's in PDF format. Everything's downloadable. There's new stuff every day. So those are three places you can go to. Yeah, and, and if you're a podcast listener, uh, the Mises Institute has a podcast and they've got a ton of free books on there that are very interesting that I've been delving through over the past few years. Yep, there's a lifetime, Aaron. You can spend your lifetime there. Is Do you have one book, one or two recommendations related to Austrian economics that you'd recommend for a beginner? Well, it's hard to say beginner that there's... Peb Island actually is, is writing a, 
an introduction to Austrian economics. He's calling it a prima, P-R-I-M-E-R, um, but it's not quite ready yet. Um, there are a couple of books on the site at Mises.org. You can search for um, an introduction and you'll find a, a couple of useful texts there. Um, one that I like is, is called Austrian Economics A Prima, uh, and it's not the Mises Institute, it's from the Adam Smith Institute in the UK by Eamon Butler, and uh, that's a great introduction to Austrian economics. So Austrian Economics A Prima by Eamon Butler, and um, another one that, that people like a lot, which is a free book from the Mises Institute, is is Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Um, and that's exactly you know, what it says in the title, an easy way to learn Austrian economics. But ultimately, you've got to read Human Action, which is Ludwig von Mises' great treatise. It's, uh, it's a hard read. It's a fabulously rewarding read. Um, you, Bob Murphy, Robert Murphy, is, has written a uh, kind of... Um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Scholar's Notes kind of book around it called Choice. Um, but eventually, sit down and read Human Action. Even if it takes you 10 years, it'll, it'll pay you back. Excellent. Thank you for those recommendations, and thanks again for coming on the show today. Aaron, thank you very much. I appreciate it, and uh, I hope to see people's comments on some of our sites. Thank you.